people's economy. We'd like to remind everyone that the media could be here. And it's also being web streamed, uh, this session. So we're sitting today in 2012, and we know that Africa's endowed with minerals. Um, everyone says it's very richly endowed with minerals. Seems to be a commodity boom for Africa. And foreign investors are coming into Africa, taking advantage of the, the demand for Africa's minerals, uh, from China especially. The question that I'd like us to all deal with today is, can minerals contribute to other forms of economic development and what we're calling in this session a post-mineral era? What I think about a post-mineral era is not necessarily that mining is finished, but that mining isn't seen to be the only form of major economic activity for Africa. So what else can mining achieve? It's been very interesting during this uh, WEF week in Addis Ababa, some of the key themes that have emerged. You know, that Africa's on a tipping point uh, for economic growth, making major strides in technology advances, agricultural advances, health, banking, infrastructure. Um, there's a massive consumer market that's emerging. But there's also significant and very deeply rooted social, economic, political, and social challenges that still exist uh, on the continent. So when we're sitting here in perhaps 20 years' time, what will we be saying when we look back on the last 20 years? Will we be saying that mining and minerals contributed to Africa's development, societal prosperity, or will we be saying, which many people think, that mining, will, mining was a curse on Africa? So how do we avoid that curse? How do we promote mining as an endowment for future generations? What are the conditions, the responsibilities and actions that we need to do today and take today to create this post-mineral economy? So we, we got a great panel here today. I think for the first time in WEF Africa, we have miners and farmers sitting on the same panel. Um, we have Paul, Professor Paul Collier from Oxford University, Minister Fofana from Guinea, the Minister of Mines from Guinea, Bruce McNamara, the CEO of Technoserve, um, and Joseph um, um, Matthews, sorry, from uh, Arcelo Mittal, and Sean DeClean um, from Yara. Paul, if I could begin with you. Thanks so much. We've got a full house, and yeah. so we should have, because yeah. this is the big story for Africa over the next decade. It's the biggest opportunity Africa's ever had, but if it repeats history, it'll be the biggest missed opportunity. And so the challenge is how to avoid that repetition of history. The default option is repeat history. History doesn't, didn't just happen, that history of plunder and squander didn't just happen, there are forces producing it. Right? In March, Kenya announced the discovery of oil. By April, we had two disturbing phenomena. One, public sector workers demanding a big wage increase, and two, uh, the localities near the oil saying, it's ours. Right? That's the default option, populist. Right? That's what's got to be lived out. A rival narrative of responsibility has to be developed. Now, it's not inevitable that societies repeat history. Let, let me, let me, uh, let me try. This is, this is termed in technical public speaking terms the graveyard hour because everybody's asleep. So let me wake you up. What's the best run economy in Europe today? Germany. Yeah. Now the hard question. Too hard for you to answer. Why is it the best run economy in Europe today? It's the best run economy in Europe today because it used to be the worst. Right? Three generations ago, Germany went into hyperinflation. Coming out of that, Ordinary people had that searing sense, never again. Across Africa, there's that awareness that the past history of resource extraction is plunder. There's that same burning sense of never again. 
the German genius was to harness never again into practical steps which made it a reality. They put in place rules, they built dedicated institutions to enforce the rules, and above all, they built a critical mass of citizens who understood why those rules and institutions were necessary and have defended them ever since. That's Africa's task now. Build the rules, the dedicated institutions, and the critical mass of people who understand why responsible management of this opportunity is so important. So what are some of the key steps? One key step is save. If you don't save out of resource revenues, then it's unsustainable. Huh? Kenya's only got so much oil, we don't even know how much yet, but it needs to save a, quite a lot of those revenues. Save for what? The Norway model? Put it all abroad? No, no, no. It's a good idea for Norway. Norway has more invested capital per worker than any other country in the world, literally. And so Norway's wealth is more productive owning capital in Brazil or capital in China than yet more capital in Norway. Right? Does that make sense for Africa? Absolutely not. You've got less invested capital per member of the labor force than anywhere else in the world. So save, yes, but use that savings to finance investment domestically. That is easier said than done. Invest domestically how and invest domestically in what? Right? Some of you, not many, will be as old as I am and remember Nigeria in the mid-1970s, that first oil boom. And the Nigerian government did try and invest. Right? It produced something called the cement armada. Anybody here remember the cement armada? Big news at the time, right? The squandering of an investment effort, very sadly. Um, now, so how should investment be handled? And the answer is that you need to build the capacity to invest well. I call that investing in investing. The public sector needs to build the capacity to invest well. The private investment environment needs to be improved. The unit cost of capital needs to be lowered. Right? I'll just give you one thing on the public sector investment process. There's a new index called the Public Investment Management Index put out by the IMF. You can just Google it. And up it will pop a rating for about 90 countries in the world. And that Public Investment Management Index is split into four processes like is there good project selection? Is there good project implementation? The first step in improving the capacity to invest is to benchmark where you are. And that provides a benchmark of where you are. Right? Um, so much for invest how, you need to build the rules and institutions that ensure that the investment process is sound. Invest in what? You know, there's a temptation to look to get fixated about whatever mineral is coming out of the ground and imagine that the right thing to do is to add value to it. I don't think that's right. You know, when the mineral runs out, if you've built your economy around that mineral, your whole economy is going to go down. You need to diversify your economy. And so what are the first steps in diversification so that in 20, 30 years' time, you've actually got an economy which can survive if that natural resource runs out. One big conceptual investment is cities. Africa's future is urban. Okay? Africa is going to urbanize. Cities are expensive to build. Once they're built, they make people a lot more productive. So investing in cities is a really good thing to do in the sense of building the generic capacity to develop other things later. And that's what you need, right? Um, final point, what can those of us who are not African do to help? Well, there is scope for global action here. Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative pioneered the way. That was a great global initiative, right? Um, what are the, the next steps? The next steps, get some enforcement, um, which is now starting to happen around the world. Um, back the African mining vision and back the thing called the Natural Resource Charter. Natural Resource Charter, 
which is this thing. I've got loads of copies of it. You're all welcome. Um, it's the minimum decision chain for harnessing natural resources for sustained development. Start with transparency. It's the right place to start, but don't end with transparency because you've got to get a lot of decisions right, not just once, but for a whole generation. Thank Thanks very much. Minister Fofana, Guinea is... Um, hugely endowed with, with minerals and has got some mega projects underway. Um, bauxite, uh, for example. How is the Guinea government uh, tackling the challenge of ensuring that the mining that's going to be happening in your country um, can trigger other forms of economic opportunity for Guinea? Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, before starting, you know, to elaborate on the question, I would like, you know, uh, to share with you an anecdote, you know, happening in my country. Uh, I can say there's one company, Boxata company, operating in Guinea since 25 to 30 years. I take a look at what amount of money was generated from the beginning of the operation by this company in terms of revenue for the company and for the Guinea government? When I tell you the figure, you'll understand that this session is more than important. This company has generated or uh, uh, and those 325 billion US dollar. Guinea government, 4 billion. You see how important is really this session because it's uh, very important for me to share with you what, what we are doing now, you know, to uh, uh, to have a solid basement for the current uh, uh, activities of the mining sector in Guinea and the future of Guinea after a mineral resource era. First of all, the most important thing is to put in place a very good and sound policy. Policy in terms of mining activities policies in terms of sound uh, uh, economical policies comprising financial and uh, monetary policies. When I'm talking about uh, good policy, I'm talking about our new mining code. This new mining code, based on the experience that I, I just uh, told you there's a, a minute ago, we change everything related to the governance. The governance is becoming the first important point in our new mining code. The second point is transparency. Coming back to the governance, we told if one mining company is uh, is proved that you gave uh, you gave uh, perhaps to one civil servant you know to gain an advantage in uh, during the negotiation of a convention or a contract this company will lose if he has already granted the concession he will lose the concession if the civil servant is recognized that he has uh, received something from one company your trial and fired. About the transparency, we put in this convention, uh, new mining law that any single title, contract, convention will be published, put on the web. Everybody will see what the Guinean government has signed with the say uh, company. And for the uh, civil society and the communities, a very important emphasis is will put, uh, was put on, on, on this aspect. Because uh, the civil society 
are the uh, uh, ultimate beneficiaries. We are talking on behalf of uh, them, and uh, everything we are, we are doing is to improve the, their well-being. In this case, we said from the designing of the project till you know, the end of the project, they will be involved. They, have, they, will, they will have their say. And if I, I pass to the monetary policies, this is related to the management of the revenue uh, generated by the mining activities. First of all, there is um, some kind of a paradox in between the revenue generation by the companies in terms of uh, budgetary management because the, flu, uh, the flux of money coming from mining sector, if I take the case of Guinea, in five years uh, we'll be dealing with maybe two billion or three billion US dollar per year. This is very good, but it has its uh, adverse effect, inflation. How to deal with that? How to control the expenses? How to manage the revenue? This is another aspect of the uh, revenue management. Now, coming back to the uh, transparency, the transparency is very important there because any cent coming from the mining uh, sector has to be saved and uh, efficiently used by, by, the, uh, by the government. Everybody must know what we have done with this cent and what was the destination. But when the flux of money come, uh, generated by the mining sector is becoming substantial, the management issues you know, will be raised. How to expend efficiently this revenue? This I call the basement for uh, uh, the country uh, present. Because if this present is well designed, you can be sure that the future will be guaranteed. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Minister Fofana. I think you uh, gave some uh, good practical examples to what uh, Paul was talking about. The rules and institutions. Yeah. Um, Bruce, uh, Minister Fofana, talks about a present to the country. Um, you're involved in a lot of agricultural work across Africa, across the world, and you've also been involved in a lot of partnerships between farmers and miners. How can this present uh, that uh, Minister Fofana is talking about be translated into agricultural opportunities? Yeah. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, and, as, and as you've noted, as running an NGO that focuses on private sector development, a lot of our emphasis is on enterprise creation, agribusiness, and agricultural value chains, but particularly as relate to smallholder farmers and their inclusion in commercially viable businesses. We also do a lot of work in the mining sector, and it turns out there is some overlap there. And just three particular things uh, to note as I think about what is this link between mining and agricultural development. One, and I think implicitly Paul was talking about, the minister is talking about this, how do you think about Dutch disease and its effect on competitive agriculture and exports in a context in which you're be, you have the opportunity now to be thinking about how do you save and what are the kind of investments that you might make. Secondly, and much more locally, it's how mining companies are beginning, I think, to think about the investments they're making in local communities. I think historically, much of that has been around kind of a broad base of social services, hospitals, schools. And I think in the last probably 10 to 15 years, there's been increasing investments in local economic development in the first wave of that, and appropriately in local content and in development of local supply chains of goods and services into mines. Very appropriate, it's what the mine does, it's very consistent with local economic development. But I think what you're seeing now with many mining companies thinking beyond the mine gate. So what kind of investments in local economic development can we be making, maybe not just ourselves, but in concert with regional or national governments, in businesses whose market may not be the mine, 
and in agriculture who may have nascent regional, local, regional, national, or even export opportunities wanting only investment both in capital and in kind of human infrastructure that's required to access those markets. And just by way of example, uh, I know Rio Tinto for a long time has been making those kind of investments in Guinea around Simfer in local economic development and supply chain into the mine, now thinking about actually entrepreneurship in a local context. But we've done a lot of work in the last year with Rio Tinto thinking about actually what's the opportunity in agriculture? What's the opportunity in oil palm for biofuel production, which actually can actually fuel some of the transport needs of uh, the, the flow of materials into and out of the mine, but more broadly, what's the actually opportunity for investment in rice for import substitution or in pineapple for export? Similarly, we've worked with Ahafo in, uh, in Ghana thinking about, what, gee, what's the opportunity outside of the gold mine in Chile or in soy or in plantains? How do you actually think about real demand out there in the world and linking smallholder farmers and, uh, and the kind of economic e ecosystem around them successfully into those markets. Uh, anglo Zemele in South America, many of you know, actually set up dedicated funds for investment in local private sector uh, companies. Some of those are in kind of the agriculture space. And some of those may be engaged in primary production, but some are also engaged in value-added sort of you know, pr uh, processing, packaging, and the like. So there's a whole area here that talks about local uh, inclusive development that's looking even beyond the life of the mind to what kind of viable economic opportunity is left behind and some of that's around agribusiness. And the third thing I talk about and it's something familiar I think to many of us is how do you think about say you know, the spatial development initiatives? How do you think about mining as an anchor for investment in certain corridors. If you're putting in the investment in infrastructure, in rails, in port facilities, in roads, how do you think in concert with mining companies, with governments, with donors about doubling down on those investments to the benefit of local agriculture? What can I do to think of about a feeder road system into that particular transport corridor that'll benefit agriculture? And actually the flip side works as well. If you're thinking about investments in an infrastructure like in support of agriculture in the Nakala corridor, a Zambezi corridor, Bera in Mozambique particularly, how do you think about the opportunities that might open up for actually natural resource extraction? Maputo Development Corridor is probably the most successful instance of de corridor development in Africa. Well, you know, it's not just benefiting the mining actually participants in that, it's actually benefiting agriculture as well. So I think those are just three examples I would cite of how you can think about leveraging investments made in mining to benefit sustainable agriculture and the broader economy. Uh, thanks, Bruce. And then we're going to pick up with Sean um, just now on, on these corridors and, and, and what makes them successful and how mines can get involved and mining companies can get involved. But Joe, you're from Marcelo Mittal. Um, a major mining company with uh, a serious investment in Liberia. Um, in your opinion, how are you structuring your investments today to enable these backwards and forwards linkages, as well as the sideways linkages which uh, Bruce has been talking about? And what is the ArcelorMittal philosophy in terms of this? Okay. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for inviting, <clears throat> inviting me to this panel and share the stage with the esteemed professor and uh, the honorable minister. Um, as, as you said, ArcelorMittal is probably better known as a steel company, but we definitely have a strategy of upstream integration into mining, and Liberia is actually the tenth country, but the first greenfield project that we started. Now, I believe how mining projects are structured has changed and is changing. And what we have undergone in Liberia is clearly not the end goal, but we learned a lot, the government learned a lot. When we went into Liberia in 2005, it was uh, a time when almost no other company wanted to go in, because all you had to do is Google Liberia and be scared. Um, um, you know, but would we believed that um, with the support of the international community, with the support of the, the, um, the government structure coming in Liberia, that Liberia had started to turn the corner. 
So one of the first challenges, of course, was the new elected government of President Johnson Sirleaf. Um, you know, like all governments, she was very skeptical of our earlier agreement, but we were fairly open. And we said, you know, there's mining, when we get into a country or when any company gets into a mining contract, you're in there for the long term. And, you know, it was not our intention to start a marriage with a fight. So, so we definitely, we, in the end process, we lost a lot of time, but I think we have a successful result. What happened was, here was a country with some of, you know, all the challenges that Africa has and maybe more because a lot of it was destroyed in Liberia. There was clearly things like the infrastructure. Um, you know, in retrospect, building the infrastructure, the hard infrastructure, be it the rail and port, was probably easier than the soft infrastructure. It was trying, as Professor Collier mentioned, you know, trying to get the policies, even now, six, seven years after the new government in place, I think a lot of the rules, the policies, the laws, is still a work in progress. Um, you know, it places companies like ArcelorMittal a little, I mean, we, we are definitely a development partner. We've helped the country open doors and, you know, initially it was a little bit because we had to bring in international contractors and they, it opened their eyes. Um, but later on and now as you see, I mean, there's so many other investors and other industries coming in uh, that has helped, helped Liberia. But Going back to how we, how we, had, we had to build, I mean, you definitely had to build, uh, I talked about policies and rules. Just use an example. On environmental, the country of Liberia obviously wants to grow more food, and so they are, have embarked on almost destroying forests to do that. So we had to sh basically explain that there, you know, there is, um, I mean, we've done an excellent ESIA, and actually today it's the best uh, body of data that's now open uh, to the public uh, on flora and fauna for West Africa, or at least that region of NIMBA where we are operating. So, so we've had to uh, almost kind of show some of the, some of the uh, pitfalls of just you know, pointing, I mean, clearly the country needs more food, needs more jobs, needs to get their people working. But uh, in a country where you've lost a generation from uh, not having schools, um, there's a lot of people that want work, but they have, uh, that, that, that want jobs, but they have no idea how to work. And that's, that's the challenge. So we spent a lot of time, I mean, we've um, initially, uh, we were partners to get the EITI going, and as, you know, clearly that transparency is needed, but I think there's a lot more. I mean, currently we've started this uh, thing called a Corporate Responsibility Forum, and, um, you know, it's very interesting. In 2008 and 2009, when the world economy was down, we were really skeptical whether we could make a go of this project. But there was a silver lining to this cloud. It gave us some pause, it gave us some time. So we engaged in partners like GIZ and, and um, uh, UNDP um, to talk about how to solve these soft infrastructure things. And so now we have a healthy corporate responsibility forum with you know, all the other major companies um, in it. And, uh, to do an example, the big project we are working on currently is to do this, uh, to do a supply chain and to try and get um, uh, local businesses to understand what the needs of big companies are. Thanks, Joe. Um, Sean, you're the co-chair of Grow Africa, um, which has been a major um, uh, initiative at, in Addis this week. Um, going to be launched at the G8 uh, next week. Um, the central proposition of Grow Africa are these development corridors. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the science or the, the approaches to these development cor corridors in terms of the collaboration, cross-sector collaboration, cross-industry collaboration, and what lessons um, the mining sector could take um, in terms of enabling the mining sector to trigger other forms of, of development. Thanks, Paul. 
I, I'm going to say, I mean, you've said at the beginning as well, it's nice to have farmers and miners on the same panel. And uh, I'm just remembering back, actually, when you say that two years ago, when we did a similar session to this, uh, and there was the mining group next door and the agriculture group, and I think you were facilitating on one side, and yeah, we suggested over lunch we should maybe just break down the wall because we had agriculture on one side and mining to actually get these two together. Uh, so well done, you've brought this group together. So yes, now on, on these corridors, I mean, Bruce mentioned it and it has been, you know, I think, quite a, a, an interesting journey from the agriculture side for companies that have been involved. Uh, I mean, you know, we, we had the pleasure of kickstarting it, but it's become much bigger than that, as you said, with this Grow Africa movement now involving seven countries, you know, taking centre stage at the G8 next week. And, um, and, and the, um, I mean, I think what we're seeing, the power of this is that, as Bruce said, you can really leverage off the fact that you've got this infrastructure, the key ones that are starting with the Bayer Corridor, you know, this is because Vale are coming in there on the mining side, the, you know, the Sagkot Corridor that President Kikweta is championing, you know, which is the rail line through to Zambia, and, uh, and the simple idea is just, you know, can you cluster agriculture growth? along those corridors where you have the railroad electricity link. If you're going to build a backbone of irrigation for agriculture, can you already use this existing framework? And, uh, but then it becomes that question of leverage as well. How can you, I mean, I'm sure the mines would be very happy to take some of this infrastructure costs I was talking about with Michael Solomon earlier, because, you know, this point of off their balance sheet in some ways, you know, bringing in broader development financing for this, because it has this much larger impact. And you can, you can sort of look at that more structured, integrated approach into, agri into economic growth. And, and I think that's very powerful, is that leverage ability. Because, you know, agriculture, getting agriculture investment into Africa is going to be a very cross-linked driver to, to that sort of removing the curse aspect that you say about mining. Because if these linkages to the rest of the economy are very strong, you know, then, then you, that, that becomes, you know, even more and more evident of the value of that. However, to make that happen, and I think you mentioned is, I mean, it has to be transformative. It has to be beyond an individual company, in my case, you know, a large fertiliser company, saying this is our mandate. I mean, you can't, to pull off a corridor framework like this requires, and I think you mentioned the term horizontal linkages, you know, beyond just thinking on our value chain and our supply chain in a very literal sense. You have to line everybody up. You have to get the finance companies involved who are both supporting the mines and supporting agriculture, you know, to make those linkages. You need to blend you know, finance from donors in so that it creates a catalytic effect uh, for this. You need to get the cell phone companies, you know, who are looking at rural agriculture to link into this. So we see the Vodafone in Tanzania is now signing a deal, you know, with the Tanzanian government to test out their whole rural infrastructure platform in Tanzania along this corridor because of the backbone that exists. But it requires a lot of transformative partnerships, which also requires facilitation. And that's a mindset shift as well. I mean, you know, we've struggled to bring this group together. You can imagine out of something like WEF, which is meant to do that, you know, you can imagine how hard that is in the field, you know, where you actually, you know, have to have that sort of neutral, independent broker facilitator role. You know, I'm looking down here on the Ethiopia context. They have the Agricultural Transformation Agency. You know, do they have a, a sort of equivalent for mining that then is, you know, cross-linked? into that as they, you know, as, as they go into that. So how do you create these transformative partnerships that go beyond sectors? And uh, you know, what, are the, what are the methodologies and what are the ingredients that are going to create that leverage effect? Because that's what basically Africa is looking at, is how does it use this double you know, benefit, both the resource boom that it has and this vast potential for agriculture which is so you know, important for global food security issues as well. How does it bring those both together to create a win-win scenario that really <coughs> leapfrogs development agendas? But it won't happen on its own in a natural, organic kind of way. It's, it's got to be manufactured and it's got to be you know, sort of facilitated and, and you know, really allowed to go to scale. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that most of the majors who are coming into Africa to, to mine they're looking for mega projects. They're looking for very long-term projects. Um, they're looking for um, high-value projects. And certainly, they are making massive capital investments um, into countries. So they're really looking at the long-term. And 
agriculture also needs to look at the long term. So I think it is, a, a, you know, the opportunity is how does Grow Africa and Mine Africa begin to work together um, to, to solve some of Africa's key developmental challenges. Paul, the economic governance frameworks that you were speaking about uh, earlier and which Minister Fofana also alluded to, also talks to situations in Africa where, you know, there are conflict minerals, um, there are countries which uh, are still um, in conflict, etc. Um, what do you think needs to be done un under these situations where clearly the world needs some of these minerals and, and, and metals? Um, and how do things need to shape up to ensure that those situations don't cause problems for um, the, 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 the formalized uh, investments that need to take place? Yeah, I, mean, I think first let me say I entirely agree with this development corridors approach and what makes it difficult is that it's a coordination problem um, and government has an irreducible role in delivering that coordination um, now to, to, to manage that coordination in a context of rules like the mining code institutions, Guinea is also establishing an investment fund to actually manage its investment spending very sensibly. Um, let's think of these, these rail investments. Um, at their best, these rail corridors can indeed open up a whole area. And at their worst, they're just owned and operated exclusively by one mining company that then denies agriculture and denies other mineral companies, so that in effect all the resources left to be discovered are captured by the, by the mining company that owns the rail. So getting some rules in place about operating these, these rails, railways is very important. They need to be multi-user, multi-function, ideally independent operator. You know? that, that seems to me to be the, the, the lesson of this, try and get some independent operators into these rail networks. And as you say, it's good news for the resource extraction companies if they can get some of this cost off, off budget, you know. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the conflict, you know, um, conflict from minerals is, is going down a lot. It's going to down a lot. It, we've learned a lot here. Um, you know, Kimberley process in diamonds was a big advance. Uh, Kimberley st still needs strengthening um, because it's, you know, it's getting uh, a bit... Uh, corroded at the edges, but that process of getting these things certified so that you track the, the, the source, um, that's a good way to go in, I think, in containing conflict. So it's, it's back to these business of, you know, build some, build some rules, build some dedicated institutions which manage, like, like timber. I mean, you, you gave the excellent example. There's, there we're getting a, a certification process for timber and a back-to-source thing where, where timber is actually... Uh, identified at source. Um, so this is the way, I think, to deal with, with, with the conflict. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Minister Fofana, you spoke uh, eloquently about the fact that the citizens need to participate in the benefits from mining. But we see across the country and the continents um, that citizens are often marginalized from the real benefits uh, from what uh, mines have to offer um, for various reasons. Um, how do you envisage that the, the citizens of Guinea will, and especially around the mines, will continue to support the development of the mining sector over the long term? I think uh, <clears throat> it's not uh, only the communities uh, surrounding the mining site, Good. but in terms of measure that uh, we have taken to ensure that the communities are involved in the mining activities uh, are, first of all, uh, we, we uh, demand, well, we requested from mining companies to build the capacities of uh, the communities, the population surrounding uh, uh, the mining site. In terms of participating First of all, in the employment, because many companies used to say, oh, 
they are not qualified. They are not qualified. We cannot, uh, you know, hire them. Then we, we, we ask, you know, the company, because they are not qualified, uh, do the necessary uh, uh, effort in order, you know, to make them able to participate to the minor uh, activities. Because you have, for instance, uh, 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 security bodies, you know, for the mine. You have drivers. You have, um, <coughs> uh, I mean, the driver for the uh, mining equipment, which is very specialized, and uh, the uh, driver for the trucks. It's a completely different. You know, if you know, the communities are involved in terms of employment, you see, they, 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 they believe that they are part of the adventure. This is the first thing. In this case, they must uh, reinforce their capacity in order you know, to, meet this, uh, to meet these needs. The second point is really uh, creating health centers, schools for the kids of, uh, uh, from the communities, health center to take care of the health issues. And third one, this is the most important, is uh, the microfinance or microcredit you know, to uh, the communities. This has a direct impact on their life. Because someone who cannot afford you know, to have hundreds of uh, uh, US dollars per day, he can have a credit for uh, 2,000 US dollars. At the end, he do, uh, this uh, uh, person can see in his pocket uh, 200 as return. It changed completely his life in terms of meeting you know, the health care of uh, his kids, uh, the necessary uh, fees for uh, school, <coughs> and even you know, for uh, the basic needs, feeding the, the family. This is the only way you know, to uh, make sure that the community uh, did the appropriation of, of the project. And the more importantly is really now about the uh, private sector. Because in the mining activities, 20% of the revenue generated comes from the mining activities. But 80% uh, are generated from the connex activities surrounding the mine activities. So, if we let the uh, companies bring uh, in, in the country all those uh, small spe uh, specialization in terms, for instance, you know, industrial, uh, industrial, uh, I mean, uh, for industrial, uh, you know, cooling, or the cooling yeah. system, for example, for, for for a plant. Fabrication. Like, exactly. You have uh, masonry, you have the carpenters, and you have wel specialized welders, so and so. You know, they can bring, you know, the foreign company in for, to do that. But if, you know, the uh, private sector are involved on that, they can uh, build their capacity to do so by assisting them by uh, 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 doing vocational training on, on those fields. The second point is to allow the private sector, you know, to to grant, uh, uh, to be granted contract, or you know, uh, beneficial benefiting uh, local purchase. Instead, for instance, uh, uh, bringing peanuts from the United States, we are big producer of peanuts. They can buy that vegetable. Some companies, they even the vegetable uh, comes from. Uh, from uh, outside world. Can I ask uh, Bruce, these linkages that uh, the minister is talking about, um, in your experience, how can you scale these things up, peanut, peanut right. growing, vegetable growing, beyond the CSI type corporate social investment project into something that has impact potentially at a regional level? Yeah. Um, and how can the 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 linkages from mining enable that to happen. Can you give us some practical? Yeah, I think that it's not simple, but you know, as we think about agribusiness, agri agricultural development in a broader context, you're pick in some sense you got to think about it like a business opportunity, and in that sense, you're picking the most attractive opportunities. So the investment in a local context ought not to be in necessarily in whatever everybody happens to be growing. 
but let's think more systematically and thoughtfully and with a kind of business lens here and say, in this particular region, where you have the investment capability brought on by sort of mining investments there, it may not be maize. Actually, it may be rice. It may be pineapple. Why maybe? Because there's actually a broader, bigger market for it out there. Because actually in some comparative advantage, competitive advantage analysis of the opportunities, it isn't maize. It's actually in horticulture or it's in uh, cotton. Uh, but to think about the local investments you're going to make with that investor, with that business hat on that says, what are the broader set of opportunities? And again, they may be local, they may be regional, they may be international. But that's the lens that ought to be applied. And that not just in agriculture, but even in the kind of small business opportunities that you're... If you had an investment fund, have the commercial discipline to say, some of the ideas that entrepreneurs have locally are good ones, and some aren't. Because you've got to be thinking longer term in the commercial sustainability in agriculture and small business. So I just want to come back to Sean. Um, the local agricultural potential next to a mine. From a corridor perspective, how can a mine who's thinking it's got a life of mine for 20, 30 years, who's thinking small scale, um, try to you know, generate some agriculture around its um, area, how can that potentially link to a much larger agricultural opportunity where the mine might not necessarily want to take all that risk? Well, I mean, I, it's always good coming last. I can just build on what you're saying, Bruce, you know, so and make it sound like you know, it's adding to it. But I, just building on what Bruce is saying, it's, uh, I mean, it's this idea of clusters as well. I mean, if you stick with the horticulture one, if you've got a mine that's gone and you've got that power capacity there, then you can sell right up front. You can sell to an investor, look, this would be ideal for a cold storage you know, unit and, uh, in, in that area. And then you work with government around that mine to create a, a horticulture cluster because you know, and the investors on both sides then become very happy because they've got that link and, you know, there's that, you know, and you can move to value addition or whatever it is because you've got that guaranteed supply of electricity and all of that and because it's a mine that's not going to get cut off that often, hopefully. Uh, and, uh, and so you can create that economic cluster which then has a, a long-term viability, which you can then translate into, you know, you can then take that off balance sheet in some way to create, whether it's a bond or anything else, you know, that a framework, that a financing mechanism where you can actually look at that in a structured, long-term way. And uh, so we had a very interesting conversation a couple of days ago here with a group of investors who were looking at pension fund development. You know, and how can they bring pension fund development into agriculture? But one of the questions that came up very quickly was, how does agriculture link to long-term you know, developments like mining, because that's what they're looking for, is long-term security. So you would then create a, a, a financing framework that links those two together. And it, it's those kinds of, you know, uh, um, imaginative thinking, if we could really do this, I think are very dynamic. But uh, the, the, the thing I just want to take a, beyond that, for the long-term, what it requires is long-term leadership. And it's the word that, you know, it's implicit in what a lot of what we're saying, but no one's actually used that word. And this requires committed long-term leadership. I mean, for us, developing this corridor initiative, we launched it you know, back in 2008 at the UN as an idea. And here we are, you know, four years later, and it's now Grow Africa, and it's you know, going, and people were standing up on the platform yesterday with President Kikwete saying, we should have all 54 countries now part of Grow Africa. And you're like, you know, <laughs> this is a big thing. But what, what was powerful about this was this came from Kikwete's vision that, and it was the same in Mozambique with President Gabuza, that they could see very clearly the use of this rail transport linkage, you know, for Kikwete, the link into Zambia. For him, this was a selling strategy that he could take to the Chinese government to get them as part of why they should upgrade the whole railway line back from the Copper Belt and use Tanzania uh, as a competitive advantage for them because he could sell that they were actually going to economically empower the Tanzanian end of that line, which didn't have much mining, but could be used for agriculture. And then not only did he have the vision, he's gone out and led from the front. You know, and we've seen that you know, with a series of now heads of state here you know, around this, having that vision and just being able to translate that vision into something very powerful and commit to that. And that's created a champions group below 
those heads of state who have then been able to take that vision on and, and institutionalise it to create these, these facilities that can make those long-term commitments at the local level. So I, I would add leadership yeah. as, a, as a critical so, dimension. Um, Joe, what do you think, therefore, are the like, really serious conversations that need to happen between the mining sector and governments and other sectors yep. now to, to have this vision for the next 20 years to create endowment. What do you think those conversations need to look like? Okay. Uh, you know, it's very interesting listening to what's going on in East Africa. I think in some respects, West Africa is quite, a, you know, maybe even a decade behind. Um, I just use the example of rail corridors and how it improves uh, uh, agriculture and local business. You know, while we were building our 300-kilometer railway, we had to up, you know, build a road alongside it so that the workers and materials could move up and down. And, and that in itself transformed that region of the country because, remember, in, in places like Liberia, you're not moving produce by train loads. You're moving initially by baskets on on women's heads. And so, you know, as soon as the road was built, sure, there were taxis and small lorries plying that, that, that opened up these places. And, and when we did our ESIA, we saw a whole lot of, you know, uh, communities that did not have access to the road, a road, got a small price for pineapple, I mean, than those that were closer to the road. You know, so so it, 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 I think it benefited all these communities. But now going to the, your question, what can we do? Um, I, again, I'll use an example. We've had to put all our infra infrastructure in, not, you know, I mentioned the rail and port, but also power. Um, so right now, I mean, uh, there are a lot of discussions going, and I think they're going in the right direction with the West African power pool. You know, places like Liberia and Guinea have tremendous hydro potential. And we, we want to be there to use that potential whenever it comes up. But things like hydro uh, takes 10 or 15 years, and a project like ours can't wait that long. So right now what we have is we've put on our own power plants in our communities. We're working with deals to, in Buchanan to sell it to the locals there, and you know maybe ideas like a cold storage, or I know that there's somebody talking about putting in a flour mill there. It'll come in handy. We've already started something up in our mine area. There's actually a, a, a university working, and they've expanded very well. And they had their own little generators, but uh, we just started a conversation where we'll start providing their power because it's a little more reliable. Obviously, a whole lot cheaper for them than running their own. Yeah. So, so there are, um, in the case of the power that we are, we are working not only with the Liberian government, but the ECOWAS, the, 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 uh, all the countries in West Africa over there, and through a project called the West African Power Pool. Great, great. Um, I'm, I'm, I want to open it up to the floor and have, have two or three questions. Um, please keep your questions short, Arthur. Um, and uh, <laughs> please uh, introduce who you are um, and your affiliation. I'm going to ask Arthur and yourself and let, let's, take, let's take three questions, and then please address your question to a specific person on the panel. I think uh, Professor Collier and the Minister from Guinea, the problem that the Minister describes affects all African countries. Arthur, sorry, could you just introduce yourself uh, Arthur, Mutam Arthur Mutambara from Zimbabwe, Deputy Prime Minister of Zimbabwe. The problem that the Minister articulated affects all African countries without exception. South Africa included, Zimbabwe included. The mining laws in Africa, the laws governing natural resources in Africa are <coughs> criminal and unjust. What they've done in Guinea is to come up with a new code. We're working on a new code in Zimbabwe. What can we do, Professor and Minister, to ensure that we understand the geology of our country? Mm. We quantify the assets underground. So when an investor comes, we say, we have a claim here worth $4 billion of platinum. Let's talk. The problem is we don't know the geology of our countries. How, what can we do to know the geology? And secondly, can you share with us the laws you put in place? Because the problem, uh, moderator, is that we're giving claims to companies for free. The person, the company that discovered oil in Ghana, it is theirs because they discovered it. We're saying no. The undiscovered asset in Africa has value. 
the unmined asset in Africa has value. We just don't know the value. <coughs> Professor, I agree with you, we've got beyond mining. We must invest in ICT. Mm. For example, the McKinsey research says in 2020, the collective GDP of Africa will be $2.6 trillion. Half of it, $1.38 trillion, is going to come from consumer-facing industries, mm. ICT, retail, banking, and tourism. Yeah. So let's use some of the money from mining and put it into ICT. Good. Thanks. Yeah. I'm going to take uh, two or three questions, and then we can respond and allow others to respond. Uh, there was this, thank you. Yeah, thank you. My, my question will have uh, Your name first, oh, please. Sorry. My, my name is Bright Simmons, and I'm affiliated with um, a think tank in West Africa called Imani. My question will have gone to more a Minister of Finance type person, but then I think the closest person is Minister Fofana. Um, the whole discussion, not the whole, but a good chunk of the discussion has been premised on the notion that Africa is very resource rich as far as minerals is concerned. Unfortunately, that's as odds uh, with most of the empirical data that's available. And it's at odds both with mineralogical surveys in countries as well as international surveys and geological surveys around the world. If you look at it and you look at most of the major minerals that have, uh, have major industrial applications, the truth is that Africa, on a per square mile basis and a per capita basis, is actually resource poor compared to the average globally. If that is the case, then the policy prescription is based on the branding that Africa is rich, which focus on import substitution. So we had a lot of raw materials, and all we had to do basically is become self-sufficient, have proved disastrous. Asian countries are actually, in many cases, very resource rich, like Indonesia, that focus on the notion, or rather was branded, as not being as resource rich, focus on export promotion, which means they will take resources from anywhere, add value to it, and export. That, in my view, if we don't get that fact right, that we are not as rich resource wise as we think we are, the policy prescriptions will be completely, completely Thank misaligned. You. Okay. And I'm going to come back to you. Um, sorry, I'll come back to you. Thank you very much. My name is Wenderad, uh, State Minister of Agriculture from Ethiopia. I have a question for Collier and uh, Bruce. My question is, it's very interesting to have a linkage and interaction between mining and agriculture, but they are totally different, particularly now. Just talk up a bit. Uh, Just talk up a little bit. Okay. Uh, the, the, my first question is, mining is a business of a company, and the benefit of mining goes to very few people or to the country where majority will benefit. But the issues that we are discussing here or the issues that raised is as a kind of social corporate responsibility rather than as a societal development or transformation. And what is the specific linkage that you are recommending for agriculture to benefit majority of the people in Africa and how mining can also really contribute to the societal transformation rather than like, you know, NGO activity or small people or where you, the, you know, the surplus or the profit can go indirectly. So I want to hear your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Minister Fofana, could you first address uh, yeah. um, Mutambara's okay. uh, question? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> he had uh, a very critical question, and it's really a shame for African country having a mineral resources. Our different government don't take the specific attention to the research. I mean the geological research from my own country. If you look at the national budget, I don't have any sense for research. I discussed this if we are within the government with my president and finally, we said, if we lack in order to have more benefit from our resource, the starting point is to have the necessary and available data for the mining company already processed. One company came to the, uh, comes to the, the country asking for license for title, he will find the, all the data ready. We can tell, he, tell him, here you have iron ore, the estimated deposit is around one billion ton. What, you know, 
the company has to do is the detailed study, you know, to fine tune the reserve evaluation. Then against this, the mining company pay money to, to, this, to the government. The certain point, the government ha can have right away money. But we are completely uh, tied. But what the mining company uh, could tell us about our deposit, our the quality, and so and so, we are not able to do this most important step by ourselves. Okay. This is really a very important issue to be solved by African country. But from our side, this will be corrected next, next, next year. But we said Guinea has a huge potential of iron ore bauxite, but I can tell you every month we are discovering. Discovering by company, not by, by the government. Mm -hmm. right. Now I, I have uh, signed a contract with a, a company, first of all in oil for a, a speculative seismic. That's mean, you know, the company come in, in the Guinea you know, short the offshore, uh, seismic 2D, 3D, and then uh, uh, they process the data. The data will be available for any company that uh, is willing to come to Guinea for, for uh, oil. You can buy the information there and uh, the revenue is shared between, uh, you know, the company and, and the government. Okay. That's what we we'll do. We we'll like to do the same thing for minerals. Great. Now, coming back, you know, to... Uh, the observation of uh, my distinguished guest, he is right. Now, if you take a look at bauxite, I take an example. For the bauxite, today you have two big markets you have the Atlantic Basin, you have the Pacific Basin. The Pacific Basin is consists of Australia, India, China, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, Suriname. The Atlantic Basin is roughly Guinea, Cameroon, little bit Mali, and uh, yeah, I think that's all. But Guinea represents really, you know, uh, the biggest deposit of bauxite, even at the uh, world uh, dimension. But what's the issue? Taking the case of Guinea, you, uh, you did a quick, you do the quick analysis about you know, the uh, Pacific Basin, you will find that they represent 222 billion of uh, bauxite production. The Atlantic uh, Basin is roughly 20, 20 million. And the specificity of the basin, uh, Pacific Basin is their producer and uh, consumer and transformer. They represent 60% of the market. So, the question raised by uh, the Honorable Guest is really for African country today, today to try to get the part of the market in terms of volume. But the volume is not sufficient. We have to move from the low, uh, low grade to the high grade. The high grade here being alumina. In another word, transformation. Really, our best way today to gain benefit from the mining is really transformation. Paul, well, um, could yeah. you also pick up another question which um um, was sure. asked around sure. um, import substitution yeah, as well. Sure. First, um, the, 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 the geological information. One of the first principles of the Natural Resource Charter is get public geological information before you start these negotiations with, with companies. Exactly. I'm very pleased that last year the World Bank changed its policy as a result of that and now is committed to lending either money to, to governments that want to get public geological information. IDA will now finance that with soft money. Right? Very important. I had a, 
an hour with the chief executive of the biggest mining company in the world last year. And I put it to him that governments should get public geological information. And I expected him to push back and say, no, no, leave it to the experts. Do you know what he said? He said, of course governments should get public geological information before they come to the likes of me. They'd get better deals. He should know. He should know he's on the other side of the table from you, right? Um, the, uh, the, the, the subsoil assets per square mile, um, you're quite right. Africa's known subsoil assets are a lot less than the rest of the world. Um, it's always uh, fascinating to me when my own research numbers uh, are read back to me. Um, that, was a, that was a number I reported in, in my little, new little book, The Plundered Planet, so I'm delighted that that's spreading around the world. But the implication of that number, Africa's only got a fifth per square mile as the rich world at the moment, but the key implication is not that it's got less, it's that it's found less. And the reason it's found less is it's had less, less search. There's been a lot less investment in prospecting. However, the larger implication of your point is absolutely right. That's why this session is called Beyond Natural Resources. Right? And Africa has to invest in the things that are beyond natural resources. That's why I started with the point of cities. Right? Um, they will take you beyond natural resources. They'll take you into services and industry. Um, final point, um, spreading the benefits. There was a question about spreading the benefits beyond just kind of mining. I, I got uh, the director for strategy of one of the biggest mining companies in the world to come and talk to me. And he was really worried that the next generation of resource extraction, the technology, is going, to, is going to be so capital intensive, it will employ practically nobody. And so he said, where's our constituency of support within the country? We're not going to bring any jobs. Yeah, we can build the odd school and clinic, but, you know, we know that's not the base for a, a strong constituency. And so I pitched to him the idea, you use your rail infrastructure to open up these corridors, make it multi-user, multi-function. His first reaction was, oh, we can't do that. It's got to be dedicated to our iron ore or whatever it is. Uh, by the end of the afternoon, he'd said, this is a really good idea. We could do it. Will you come and address the board? Right? So um, it's in mining companies' own interest to spread the benefits, but they don't do it by buying peanuts. To be honest, Minister, peanuts is kind of peanuts. Um, they, they do it by, um, you know, by opening up exactly these myriad of economic opportunities, which they themselves can't predict. It's not their business. But if they make these railways multi-user, multi-function, and if the governments come in in a coordinated way, and leadership's the right word, with the ports, with the power, that the government vitally has to do, then um, these, these societies can take off. Final example, Malaysia. Right? If you go back 40 years, Malaysia looked like Africa now. You know? Malaysia was a resource-rich economy, dirt poor. In the process of development, Malaysian GDP has gone up 40 times. That wasn't driven by value-added in the mining industries. It was by radical diversification, especially, for example, they built Penang as a light electronics center. It's now, you know, a light electronics center of world-class renown. And that was financed initially off the, 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 the savings out of, out of natural resources. So diversify, yes. Thanks. Um, there was an interesting insight yesterday at a session where someone said, as a result of East Africa's lack of resources, it resulted in greater integration between, uh, between the countries and, um, for East Africa, and which has resulted in economic growth models uh, outside of natural resources. So I'm just wondering, will the discovery of oil and mine and, and a lot more minerals, etc., reduce the integration? Will it create more inclusive states, um, exclusive of other kinds of... Uh, relationships. Uh, Bruce? Just a quick point on that. And I do want to come back to your question, Mr. Minister, but yeah. uh, this coordination role that we've been talking about uh, around corridors, it's not just across industries, but it is across countries. Yeah. And in fact, yeah. if you're really going to benefit from the investment in infrastructure and corridor development, it will, 
It is leadership is necessary, finding the right coordinating mechanisms and governance structures to make that happen, as with the Maputo quarter, as with some of the Bera and other quarters. It's vital. And so in that sense, I'm pretty sanguine about the prospects for increased regional integration to the extent that you're thinking in those terms. Uh, so hopefully East Africa will buck the, the trend. Yeah. That's, that's good. But you were going to address the question? Yeah. No. Oh, go ahead. No, go um, Joe. Sorry, Joe, Bruce, Joe, go ahead. There was a question. Well, I just know the, the minister had a question about, again, about mining and agriculture, and not telling you anything you don't know, but one, mining isn't going to solve for agriculture. Second thing is, you, we, mining may make investments locally, but let's be mindful of the taxes, the royalties, the concession fees that are generated by mining, and where those go. And it's ultimately, it's government investment of those revenues yeah. into in agriculture that is actually going to move the needle a lot more than local mining investments uh, in agriculture. And then I think the things that we've been talking about, I think it's making choices about where you spend money and if you're going to spend it, spend it in corridors where you can leverage somebody else. Uh, and I think that is critical and that is policymakers, you're, you have to do every day. And so to the extent you're choosing agriculture, choose to invest in those regions where you don't have to make all the investment Great. yourself. We've, yeah. we've, got, we've got a few minutes left and so I want to wrap up and I want to go through the panel starting uh, with, with, with you, Joe. Okay. Um, just what are your key takeaways from this? What, have, okay. what are your learnings from this session, um, from the questions that have been asked? And what do you think the, some of the clear action point is that, uh, as a minor, you need to address? Well, OK, I, I think what we heard, not just this session, but you know, the whole conference here, uh, you know, I, th this one focuses on, on um, uh, mining and beyond or beyond. You know, I wanted to just piggyback a little bit on what Bruce said. You know, it's, of course it's the royalties and all of that that pay, we pay the government. But remember, when companies come in, uh, currently natural resources is just the catalyst that gets this foreign investment in. Uh, we've had to train employees. I mean, today we have probably close to 4,000 jobs if you count all the contractors and all that. And of that, probably not less, I mean, there's only about 40 that are really what I'll call geology related. The rest of those are skills that, are, that we will develop and will get developed that, that, is, that will help across, across all borders, I mean, across all companies. And secondly, um, the other thing is, and I fully agree with the, the, we need to work further on getting corridors, infrastructure corridors across countries. Uh, in our particular case, one of the main things that the government of Liberia objected to our original agreement, which was again mirrored on agreements that were signed 20 and 30 years ago, was the ownership of the rail and port. And so today, the, the, the government of Liberia sits with us uh, to, di to discuss with other parties. Um, uh, and, and obviously, I mean, we would, we would, what we want to make sure is when we do that, we are not squeezed out. I mean, we're Thanks, fully sir. willing to do that. Okay, very quickly, um, Paul, Minister, I'm going to move through you. One minute, what, what's your conclusion on economic governance? Yeah, that how governments invest money, that's going to be the, because that's where the big money is. And, if, and governments can spend that well to pr promote corridors, but underlying that is the governance, the economic governance of that whole process. And so putting in place the rules, the dedicated institutions, building the critical mass of ordinary citizens who understand why these things matter so you don't just dissolve into populism, these are the core tasks of leadership. Minister? <clears throat> what I Final can words. say is, first of all, uh, one message, you know, the companies uh, can consider their, uh, as their relation with uh, the government or the state are uh, as a wife and husband. If it goes well for the company, that means, you know, the government will uh, benefit uh, something uh, from, from that. The concern are bo for both. And second is really to recall uh, the attention of the African country uh, having uh, natural resources, that we need, uh, we need coordination. Coordination <clears throat> uh, about our different policies in order to talk roughly the same voice uh, with the companies. In this case, 
we must open our different uh, mining law to share with uh, others and try to see what you know is working well in, for example in Guinea and doesn't work in uh, Tanzania and vice versa. Then we, we can uh, have some kind of lesson learned in order to improve you know the the position of our different country vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the mining companies. Thank you. And uh, the last uh, 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 message is really the clue for the present of the African country and the future of the, uh, uh, of the African country is good governance, transparency, Great and the consideration of the interests of the partners. Be fair and equi uh, equitable. Thank you. Bruce, final comment? I'm yeah, just, uh, I'm just sort of a reminder of this, that there, there's such room for collaboration and communication among multiple stakeholders beyond the initial concession or MDA that's put in place. But it, and it's local and it's national and it's multi-stakeholder. So at a local level, it's not just a mining company making the investment in local development, but how well is that coordinated with local government expenditures? The corridor example. Let's be thinking explicitly as we think about mining, about a broader set of collaborative conversations around I'm going to leverage you, you're going to leverage me, and we're going to do that across sectors. Uh, so the conversation goes beyond the immediate extraction opportunity and opportunities for collaboration or rulemaking around that to a broader set of conversations that look to a broader set of public goods that in the end work for everybody. Sean? Yeah. This is when you know you've been on too many panels together. <laughs> I, I'm going to just basically, because if I took what Bruce said and then said, right, well, how could you put that into action? That was what we did with Grow Africa on the agriculture side. I would say make that happen in mining. You know, where What we're doing next week at the G8 is you're getting companies, local, African and international companies, to make commitments to governments, governments to make reverse commitments you know, to companies about how they're going to create a transformative agenda. That has been driven you know, through this Grow Africa process to make this transformative agenda. I'd like to see the same thing with the mining companies. You played with this term Mine Africa, I don't, you know, but I mean, you know, you, but this idea of creating these commitments and creating a framework where you really have to, you know, to, to fast track those commitments to live up to them and put some real numbers to them and some real long-term metrics to that. How many jobs is that going to create? What sort of impact is that going to have? How much is that going to diversify the economy? I think that would be very powerful. Well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Sean, and to all the panelists. Um, thanks to the audience. And um, I really hope that this conversation can kickstart a lot more conversations about how to harness the collaboration between sectors, between countries, into corridors, promote the good governance uh, issues, um, come and get a book on the Natural Resource Charter, it's for free, um, and, and to really see how these kinds of conversations can lead to much more concerted initiatives uh, between mining companies around the economic models, and to really start thinking about what is the mine of the future? What does it look like? What is the economic model of the mine that is quite different to today? And I believe that uh, um, some excellent sterling work is being done uh, in this field by a lot of people uh, in the audience. So thanks very much. Thank you. You're the first. <laughs>